these days, the fastest way to get a child's attention is to block their access to Wi-Fi. <laughs> and the fastest way to get a child to do something is to tell them they can't have the new Wi-Fi password until they've done it. Our children are growing up surrounded by technology. And it's really interesting that we're here today at the Silt Mill, which is the site of the world's first factory. And it was at the cutting edge of the Industrial Revolution. Because today we're in another revolution. We're in a digital revolution. Digital technology is changing everything. It's changing the way we live. It's changing the way we work. It's changing the way society works. And it's changing the skill set that our children will need for their futures. I believe that coding, the art of giving a computer a set of instructions in a language that it understands to perform a task, is going to be an essential part of that digital skill set. And so I'd like to invite you to come on a journey with me through some of the experiences that I've had helping children learn how to code to explore why this is. And our journey starts on a train. So I was travelling down to London a couple of weeks ago and I was sitting at a table with a mum and her child and we got chatting, as you do. And the boy, we'll call him Joseph, started telling me all about his favourite book, which was called The Hairy Toe. Now, Joseph clearly loved this book with a passion, so much so that I suggested, well, maybe it would be a good idea for me to read this book. And he looked at me and doubtfully and said, well, it's in my school library. So I said, no, it's OK. It might be in my school library as well. And he looked at me absolutely baffled and said, are you still learning how to be a children? <laughs> And I said, no, no, I work in schools. I teach children and adults how to code. But at that point, I could tell that I'd lost him because he looked at his mum and he uses, that, he uses that excuse that I'm sure we've all used when we're at parties. You know when you're stuck in the boring conversation with the boring person and you need to get away? So Joseph looked at his mum and said, I need the toilet. <laughs> so off he went. But while he was gone, it got me thinking, because I know that coding isn't boring for children. I know that it's relevant, and I know that it's interesting. But how could I show this to Joseph? And so the idea of the hairy toe game was born. I had my laptop with me. I was supposed to be working, but chatting to Joseph was proving to be much more fun. And so I opened up um, a piece of software called Scratch, which is a programming tool that we use a lot with children. I drew a very rough picture of a hairy toe, and I added a few lines of code in. And by the time Joseph came back, I had a rough and ready game for him to play. And this is what happened. <laughs> so the idea of the game was that you had to move the mouse pointer over the hairy toe to catch it. It's harder than it looks, actually. But this is based all around Joseph's favourite book, starring a very hairy toe. So Joseph got to five points, and he turned to me, and he looked up at me, and he said, I wish you were my teacher. And so Joseph was convinced of the power and the magic of code. And children do need convincing, because although they are surrounded by technology, they're swiping through their social media, and they are tapping their likes, and they are waggling their thumbs on their games consoles without any understanding of the underlying technology that's going on with what they're doing. Last year, I came across an initiative called Code Club, which aims to change some of this. And I was working in a primary school in Derbyshire, and I was working with a teacher called Mrs. Devonport, and we were teaching IT and supporting IT in schools and we were really fed up. Because IT in schools was creating a Word document. And if you were really fancy, you'd create a PowerPoint presentation. And if you were really, really fancy, you'd put some Word art in it. And we knew there had to be more to computing and IT than this in schools. And so I came across this website called Code Club. And it was full of activities and projects to do with children aged sort of 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, to do with coding. And I went back and said, Mrs. Devonport, we need to start a code club. 
So we did that thing that you always do when you're trying to decide what to do. And we wrote a list of all the good, good reasons we should do it. And we wrote a list of all the reasons not to. And the reasons not to were quite complicated and long. And we thought, maybe we shouldn't do this. But then we got ourselves in gear. And we decided to give it a go. I used my computer programming knowledge from studying at university. Mrs. Devonport, being the awesome human being that she is, got involved as a teacher and gave her enthusiasm to the children. We were literally one week ahead of the kids. We started the first project ourselves the week before the kids came. And at the start, we had seven children. It was not the most popular club we'd ever run in school. Basketball club was running at the same time, so we did have a bit of competition as well. But these kids came and they engaged in a way that I'd never seen before with children using computing. And so they would do things like code a rocket so they could fly to a planet. Or they'd code a musical instrument like a drum so that when they clicked on it, it would make a sound. And they'd build that up into the whole area of a rock band that they could play by clicking on different instruments. Or they would code an alien, a talking alien chatbot, and whether you ask the alien a question, depending on how you coded it, you'd get a nice answer or a not so nice answer. And what happened really quickly was amazing because the children took these coding ideas and concepts and turned them into things that were interesting and relevant to them. So it was just like Joseph's hairy toe book, but this time the children were doing it themselves. So instead of a talking alien chatbot, one girl coded a talking unicorn. And this girl had a wobbly tooth at the time, and she was really miffed about the pain of her wobbly tooth. And so in this, the uh, unicorn's giving her sympathy and saying, don't worry, I'm sure it'll all be fine. I actually think I want a talking unicorn to do that too. And then another boy coded a surfer. So it liked the drum where you clicked on it and something happened. This surfer surfed across the wave, and when you clicked on him, he fell off and sustained some horrible, nasty injury. <laughs> so these seven children got really stuck in. And they went away and they told their friends and they told their younger brothers and sisters. And soon we had a club, a club full of 15 children who were all involved in coding and creating. And we had a waiting list too. And I got realizing very early on that this code club model worked. And so I stalked the organization for a bit, as you do when you really like something. And they had um, a job that came up on the, in the East Midlands. And my stalking paid off, because I applied for the job and I got it. And now I have the privilege of traveling around schools and seeing coding that other children are doing, and talking to universities, and talking to businesses about how we can match industry and educational skills and take them back into schools. And so now kids are doing things like this. They're creating their own paint programs so that they can pick up colors and draw things. They're creating things like times tables quizzes where aliens ask questions times table-wise, and kids see if they can answer them or not. And then they move on to other things as well. They start coding things like HTML, which is the language that web pages are written in. And this is an HTML ninja game where they use these skills to hide the ninjas on different places in a web page. And they move on to working with things like this, which is a Raspberry Pi. It's a tiny little computer or a tiny circuit board. And one boy went away and bought the Christmas tree that you can see in the um, photo with his pocket money so that he could plug it into the Raspberry Pi and start coding it to make the Christmas tree lights light up. And so coding is clearly something that engages children. And I think at this point in our journey, it's useful for us to look at what other people say about coding as well. Professor Mitchell Resnick heads up the Massachusetts Institute of Technology team that created that software called Scratch that I've been showing you a lot of. And he said that if you give the child a chance to use a computer without giving them a chance to create and code with it, it's like giving them the chance to read 
without giving them the chance to write. And we take it for granted every day now that children have the opportunity to learn how to write. But it hasn't always been so. This is um, a picture of the um, Pickwick Papers uh, Club, the novel by Charles Dickens. And that's Mr. Pickwick standing up addressing his fellow gentlemen, talking about their latest literary scribblings. So 300 years ago, writing was something that the rich and the educated did. And if you fast forward to today, coding is still seen, not necessarily for the rich and the educated, but it's seen as a, a niche elite activity that's done by a minority of people. This is the software development team at moneysavingexpert.com taking part in a hackathon, and I think they probably encompass most people's idea of the stereotypes of what coders and programmers look like. Wouldn't it be great if, just like writing, coding could be something for everyone? Now, I'm not suggesting that every child is going to grow up and be a programmer. Far from it. But we teach everybody how to learn to write, and only a few of us make a living purely from writing in professions such as being an author, a journalist, a copywriter. The rest of us use writing as a tool for other things. And that's going to be the same with coding. It will be a building block, a foundation that children will need to go on and do other things. It's often been said that everybody has a book inside them. Well, I believe that every child has a computer program inside them. Not literally. They're not robots. <laughs> but I believe that every child has the idea for a game, an animation, a program, for something that is relevant and interesting to them. And I believe that they need the opportunity to learn how to code, to express that. So coding is clearly something that is going to be a useful skill set in itself. But I also want to talk to you about other skills that I've seen children learn while they're coding. Skills which are transferable into other areas of life. So children learn about creativity. They learn to take an idea and translate it into reality. Coding offers a finite set of resources with something that you can create infinite possibilities with. And children are really quick to pick up on this because their imaginations have no limits. Whether it's a hairy toe, a talking unicorn, a dude falling off his surfboard, children have that imagination. They also learn how to be in control. Coding means you have to take decisions. It could be a small decision, like what colour something is, or it can be a larger decision, like in a game, if the character jumps and falls off, are they going to die and lose a life? Or is there going to be some kind of springboard for them to come back up? They also learn commitment. Now, here's the thing. Coding doesn't often work first time. In fact, when I code, it very often doesn't work first time. <laughs> I can see some nods and some agreement. There's this term that children use these days when they're really angry and frustrated using a computer, and they've just had enough, and they get up and they walk away, and they call that rage quitting. Well, there's no rage quitting in a code club because you are surrounded by friends and volunteers that can help you. So instead of getting frustrated and angry, you can take a deep breath, and you can decide to look at it logically and change it or fix it. And that's building up a resilience that can be transferred into other areas of life. And children also learn about collaboration. One child on their own can create great code. But two children, three children, four children working together make an awesome team because one child does the coding, another one tests it, says, oh, wouldn't it be better if you did this? Or how about if you did that? They act on each other's feedback. They test it again. They work together to create something really awesome. And so coding clearly brings these life skills that children will need. There's a myth going around at the moment that children are digital natives, that somehow they are born with the skills and the abilities to use technology inherited from their parents' generations. It's just not true. To truly create with technology, express with technology, 
build with technology and understand technology. Children need time and space to learn all these things. And so our journey ends with a choice. Do we want to raise a generation of swipers and tappers and thumb wagglers who consume technology? Or do we want to invest in the next generation to give them a skill set that will be valuable for their future education, hobbies, and careers? We have the chance to remake the way that our children interact with technology. So the fastest way to get a child's attention? Let them be coders, creators, and digital makers. Thank you.